Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Roll Wise podcast. Uh, today, we're going to be reminiscing on Dungeons and Dragons 4th edition and examining it after so many years. Uh, first and foremost, a big thank you to comments on our previous videos that suggested maybe we should look at 4th edition a little bit more closely because uh, maybe we're not remembering it as accurately as we should. Uh, and I think that's saying it generously. I mean, honestly, 4th edition has been many, many years since uh, I've touched the game, so we're we're going to start seeing what's going on there. But regardless, uh, we're going to dive in, give some fresh perspectives. Uh, we're actually going to probably play it on live stream. So if you guys are interested, we do live stream on Mondays, typically around 8.30 uh, p.m. Pacific time. And so we'll actually give it a little bit of a try and see just how the game has aged. And who knows? We might remember it more fondly after playing it than we, than we did when we first gave it a try. Uh, but let's begin with a, a brief little... Um, history lesson on fourth edition just in case people aren't familiar with it or haven't really talked about it uh, but Dungeons and Dragons fourth edition was developed by a bunch of people that are pretty well known in the industry at this point Andy Collins James Wyatt Rob Heiso uh, Mike Merles you know tons of names are associated with the Dungeons and Dragons name and it was really people at the time thought it was a very innovative edition of Dungeons and Dragons um, because it Really, it was succeeding 3.5, and it made a lot of big changes to the game. Uh, first of all, it was thinking about things like paid subscriptions to like services, and so it kind of started doing the digital thing. It kind of it got you in touch with D and D Insider, and it started it started the whole introductory product line for D and D Essentials, so that you had an easier way to get into Dungeons and Dragons more so than even Fourth Edition itself. Um, now, the crazy part about it is, is even though when it was first released back in 2008, uh, it won a bunch of awards. I don't know if you guys remember this, but apparently it won like the Luka Games Best Role-Playing Game Award. It won an Any in 2009. Uh, do you guys know that? I did not. It doesn't really surprise me. It doesn't, does it? This is back when it's all fresh and new and all that stuff. Uh, but there were definitely uh, a few other awards that that it won, you know, kind of at the beginning of the uh, beginning of its lifespan. And unfortunately, it seems like the initial hype that it had petered out very quickly. And a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people were kind of looking for that next new thing. Um, and so that's when D&D &D 5th Edition came out in 2014 or so, right? So it's it seems like it had a very short lifespan. Mm -hmm. I mean, more so than the other editions, and not, and we're not going to get into the details of three, like D and D three versus three point five, because if people want to be really mad about it, three point five was like what two thousand three. So if you bought all those books, there were three point five books. You really only had them for five years of relevance. <laughs> you were like, wait a minute, my edition changed. What the hell happened here? <laughs> so. Um, so that's that's kind of a different story. So first and foremost, did you guys actually get into D and D when it, fourth edition when it first came out? You remember? I did um, because we were running like demo games at the store, you know, for people, and I had a play group, and the guy who was our GM most of the time, he wanted to get into it. You know, he was buying the books and he was excited. Uh, and so it was a fun group to play with. And so, yeah, I, at the beginning, yeah, I played a lot. Okay. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, I did too, because like, I was really excited because really in the past, like, like advanced Dungeons and dragons going into 3.0 and then 3.5, like it was a, it was an advancement in like the quality of the game. Like you felt like the game was a little bit better with the additions. So the, you were excited because you're like, Oh, there's a new edition of D and D it's going to be, fantastic it's going to be better than mm -hmm. than what we have um and so yeah i mean i bought i mean i think i pre-ordered the whole set of books um and then i bought the like like a, a couple months later a year later when they came out i even went so far as i bought the like player's guide 2 and the dmg 2 and the monster 2 and stuff like that when they're putting on multiple books so yeah i was excited and i was looking forward to to playing it and yeah well, yeah, there was a lot I did. of problems. I did for quite a while. Yeah. yeah, there was a lot of problems with three point five. I mean, it the, the power creep had become so immense that there were a handful of classes that you needed to play. Uh, there was almost no reason to ever play a straight fighter because you had a real linear power progression. 
where you're what, what, what was the phrase they used fighters linear magic users quadratic like they went nah, oh. <laughs> you know yeah. like 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 there would there was a ton of min maxing going on mm -hmm. uh you would play at tables and go okay i hit for eight points of damage and somebody else is like their, their barbarian comes in and they're like uh i hit for 76 quadruple that you know what i mean like sure well, and it was also tough on DMs too. So, you know, as a as a dungeon master, unless you like basically limited the scope of your play for your your table and all that stuff, you you could have been surprised by somebody grabbing something from any number of books. I don't even remember the number of three five books that they ultimately ended up having at the there end was of the, a lot. the run. But well, there, there was, was a lot. There were so many, especially you know with the mm -hmm. the D twenty license. I, there was a ton of stuff. Yeah. Um, so, and so one of the things that fourth edition promised, right? Was that mm -hmm. as your characters leveled, all of the classes would feel powerful. Sure. And to an extent, they sort of met that promise mm -hmm. in the opposite way it was intended. Hmm. Okay. So I feel. did so did you guys when you first started getting into the game, um, did you guys actually play with like some of the adventures that they had published, or did you guys run into oh. like uh, kind of your own homebrew and all that kind of stuff? Uh, we definitely played uh, an adventure. I think that I think the GM started modifying stuff later, mm -hmm. you know, removing the stuff he didn't like and adding stuff that he did. But I, like, especially when a game comes out and nobody knows the rules, you you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm not saying yeah. that somebody couldn't, you know, create their own campaign, but we were trying to play, you know, not just like two levels or one. You know what I mean? We were trying to play. A lot. I think we were meeting twice a week at that time or something. So, wow. if only we had the time. Uh, well, yeah. we were drinking beer and hanging out. Like, like, like it was a decent group of friends. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think we. I don't remember. I didn't run. I, I did run when when Dark Sun came out. Um, for fourth edition, I did run a Dark Sun campaign for a couple months. Um, mm -hmm. and that was all mostly homebrew. Uh, if not all homebrew, and I think the other guys, one guy ran an all whole, an entirely homebrew campaign for a couple sessions for us, and then I think my other friend ran almost for almost a year. I think um, mm -hmm. it started as a design adventure, and then you know with homebrew elements. Okay, yeah. Because, I mean, in terms of, like, playing, I don't think I actually played very many of the games. Because this is right around the time that it came out is right about when we, um, you know, I don't I don't actually remember why we didn't play very much 4th edition now that I think about it. Because we had, a, we had a pretty good group of friends, and I thought we played a few adventures with it. But I can't remember us. I, and unfortunately, I can't remember which of the, the, the adventures we actually played. Unfortunately, and that might be just me, but I just didn't feel like they had that, they were that memorable um, in terms of how the play went and all that stuff. And we had some friends that really liked homebrewing, you know, in terms of creating their own adventures and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But I don't think they really leapt to it. I think a lot of them actually continue to play 3 5, or we actually looked at some of the other games that were in the D20 system okay. that weren't as cumbersome as D, D 3 5, but they were still kind of in that adjacent space. I know for a long time there we played um, the, what was it the the Game of Thrones sort of I uh, you know the Ice and Fire role playing game mm -hmm. that they had for a little while there? Um, so I think I think that we had a, a Game of Thrones game in the same vein that we actually were playing that for a while, um, and then when we did go back to D and D, I actually think we did go back to three five instead of instead of going to four zero because we just we were just those people so missed it just missed it just missed fourth edition entirely <laughs> yeah but Hello. you you had one of those I, I, and correct me if i'm wrong but you guys didn't do a lot of power gaming like you weren't min maxing all the characters no. right but i wouldn't say we were i wouldn't say that that was entirely off the table there was always a few characters that had unique combinations that somehow were more powerful on in in actuality than they seemed on paper like i had a few of those characters come through but it was never an intentional it was never like, oh, I'm going to make this optimal character build that I found online, and now Mike is going to cry because he doesn't know how to counter the, <laughs> you know, the infinitely powerful pixie or something like that. Um, but yeah, no, we never really worried about power gaming so much. 
Yeah, and uh, we had a couple in our group, uh, newer players. There was a group that we had that wasn't my standard friends. Mm -hmm. um, they were newer friends, and they edged towards power gaming. Mm -hmm. I do feel like 4th edition, as far as power gaming, it was flatter than the other editions. Yeah. Like, I don't, like, there were elements of power gaming, but I think those came out later. Not, I think the core classes were all pretty... Mm -hmm. um, no, balanced. they were balanced, and again, I'll say this cryptically because yeah, we can get balanced. to that. Later. I just don't think they were balanced in the right way. Yeah, we can get to that later. <laughs> sure. So, so in terms of like common critiques that Fourth Edition had, um, you know, because I think and it's just one of those ones where I feel like people either loved it or hated it. Is that one of the things that you know people said is that the emphasis on combat was really the part that made it or break it broke it for people you know the fact that you had so many tactical kind of things that you could do made the combat much better than previous editions but at the same token it meant that pretty much every your hammer was always taking out your sword and fighting it no matter what it was it, did you guys ever experience that for combat and how did you feel combat played from your perspective you know i i really liked the combat at first because i they streamlined and simplified a lot of things, which I think a lot of people gloss over. There was a lot of bullshit in 3.5. Uh, you know, some things were straight attack rolls. Mm -hmm. Some things were attack rolls, and then the person gets a saving throw. Like, they got rid of a lot of the baggage. Um, and you got to do interesting things that involved your teammates. Like, a, a lot of the stuff that some of the different... Uh, roles did, you know, involved, I'm going to tell you to go over the, you know what I mean, and attack, you know, the strategist or commander or whatever the hell they were, you know what I mean? Like, everybody was sort of involved potentially when everybody else was taking their turns. Because mm -hmm. there, there, there were there were things where you, powers where you got other people involved, which I thought strategically was neat. Um, you couldn't play the game without miniatures or a map of some kind. I, I think it's, I think trying five people sitting at a table and a DM trying to keep all track of all of that shit in their head, there is zero chance that all six people have the same picture in their head mm -hmm. if you didn't have a map and miniatures. Sure. And it made a difference. So do you think, do you think in your mind, like, cause this, this is what's, it's a very interesting component to it is that it felt like some people, you know, cause there were people in, that used miniatures up before that point. Miniatures were obviously yes. not a new thing to Dungeons and Dragons prior to that. I but, first saw them in the seventies when yeah. I first saw Dungeons and Dragons. So, but do you feel like if you the people that had embraced miniatures made the transition to D and D a lot easier than those that maybe hadn't? Or what do you think about that, Joe? Uh, I, I think I think that by the nature of the game, I think they would have had to have. It would have been easier for people that had used miniatures before, but. I can't think of any like I can't think of why somebody would go. Oh no, I'm not ever playing a role playing game that uses miniatures. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't know that I've met that person. Maybe I have, and I discounted them, which is probably unfair. But I it seems like a trivial thing to not play a game. You know what I mean? Like sure, just because you don't have the minis, and you don't, and obviously you don't have to have like detailed minis. You don't have to have professionally painted. You don't, even, you don't ones. even have you to just have. Them. You ju you could just have icons and like a basic grid map to show you where bottle they caps, are. bottle, bottle caps. caps. You you could just like use that. this. Yeah, I could use my thumb drive, right? They yeah. were much bigger back then, but I could just use this to represent my character as long as it fit in a square, right? Yep. Sure. And what about you, uh, Brent? Did you like? How did you feel like D and D's? Did you think that Fourth Edition overemphasized combat at the expense of some of the other things? Yes, I mean I am much more enamored of three point five than um, Jeff is. I enjoyed three point five a lot, and I think a lot more memorable games for me were in three point five than any mm -hmm. other edition of the game, um, both due to mechanics and just due to the role playing, like some good games. But um, we did transition over to uh, Fourth Edition. We started using miniatures exclusively. Mm -hmm. um at that time because you did really need to with the game i think at the beginning we tried not to but um we quickly found that that really wasn't possible um so we made the we made the transition and maybe at the end of 3.5 we did a little bit more with the board too just because like it helped with the tax of opportunity and stuff like that mm -hmm. um so we transitioned to like using it full time and i do feel like the 
I do. I mean, I in general, I feel like the the focus is on combat more in like a D and D style game, and I think in specific, it was very much a game that leaned toward that video game philosophy of encounter combat, like minion encounter combat, middle counter combat, and then boss encounter combat. I I, I mean, I, I think a lot of people played it that way. I think you're forgetting the skill challenges, which I, 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 is probably problematic. Um, but, like, it was the first time that D&D took into account non-combat situations for stuff. Like, how do we cross this mountain? Because most people just go, we just cross the mountain. We have our ropes and we do this. And, you know, remember the skill challenges where you had to get so many successes or so many failures, you know? Yeah, and then oftentimes and you were. I, I think the system point. was underdeveloped. And Go yeah, ahead. what I think the I think the one time I remember, and and I have forgot I had forgotten about skill challenges before, um, which was in one of the comments. I do remember skill one instance of skill challenges where um, we were on a we were on a mountain and there was like a blizzard. Um, and basically all really that did was we lost hit points for the fight and almost died when we got to the fight because we had lost hit points trying to get to the dungeon. Hmm. Um, so, so, so it felt very punitive at the time. Like the skill challenges felt like a way to make you have a more challenging time with that first fight is how kind of it felt. And that just might've been our table. I like, know I, I, we were at. Well, no, I mean, given the situation, the way you laid it out, I think it's reasonable a hundred percent reasonable that you felt mm -hmm. that way. But I mean, what if you would have succeeded in the skill challenge? You know what I mean? Like you would have gotten there quicker and there would have been less enemies there. And like, there should have been a benefit if you succeeded in the skill challenge. Well, and there may have been, but to... we didn't. So <laughs> <laughs> right. And, Who knows and, and what again, would have happened? The system was, was underdeveloped half baked maybe. And I don't think everybody knew how to use it. And I'm not saying that I did. Okay. This is not, I'm not saying this from, but the idea that us as a group of three or four or five people can all contribute to the success and not just saying, I bring my rope and I have my spikes and we're climbing the mountain. You know what I mean? Like, because maybe the mountain's just fucking impassable for our group at this time. Mm -hmm. Right. Maybe we have to go around and we can't go over or, that's just one situation that comes to mind. I mean, you, you can use well, skill challenges for anything that's not combat. I just think skill challenges are strange to me because like in like in, in you and it might say something different. I would need to look at the game. The, 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 I haven't looked I got at perfect skill memory of it. I don't have I have not looked at skill challenges in a while. So playing the game will be good for reminding us what skill challenges are like. Yeah. Uh, I just remember uh, skill challenges being kind of like rolling a lot of dice and then success is just success right like mm -hmm. you made it you didn't get hurt you didn't die um mm -hmm. whereas like so success doesn't mean as much as like not succeeding succeeding means you're just dis disadvantaged and sure. i and i and if i remember right that's kind of how the rules are written is success is just success like there's no levels of success in in D D, there's no we roll well, I mean, so many successes above what's necessary like so climbing the mountain thing right? right we're trying to climb the mountain i don't know to save two weeks of travel time right and if we succeed we save those two weeks which has to benefit us in some way if mm -hmm. we fail we have to take those two weeks going around the mountain or tunneling through or whatever the fuck we do fly, you know what yeah. i mean <laughs> waiting to book a flight i you, I, I, I don't sure. know yeah you definitely because right? this is this is a silly made-up example in my head right <laughs> well, and and so I think it, I think it's interesting because you know, from my little experience with fourth edition, you know, I I I felt like the the combats were probably longer than they should have been, and I just remember there being like weird stacking modifiers, kind of like you had to kind of get modifiers that you stacked, and it 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 was a lot more mental math, I think, than I remember. Um, but past that, I don't I I think that was really what caused it to be longer, and I don't know if that's one of those things where with practice it would have been faster and all. All of that and we and we pretty much at that point played exclusively in the theater of the mind kind of thing so we were playing fourth edition in a theater of the mind kind of setting and so there were definitely some tactical components that i don't think we explored as well 
Um, but as for skill challenges and stuff like that, what you're saying, Jeff, is that I, I feel like skill challenges are something that I would like to get better at because I do think that there's an opportunity for them to add tension. And I don't know if skill challenges were unique and then D&D kind of encapsulated it in the fourth edition to kind of create this like tension building scenario for like out of combat dice rolling and stuff like that. But I, I feel like skill challenges, the, when I have tried to do them based on my understanding of them, I don't feel like they've built the tension appropriately. And I don't feel okay. like, That's fair. and I don't, and I don't feel like they've, they were, I feel like throwing dice just isn't, if you're throwing a lot of dice, it isn't fun. Like each dice roll has to have that like impact. And so like what you're saying, like, Oh, you made it over the mountain. Therefore you beat the King's messenger to the, to the castle and you get to deliver your own message and, you know, try to, you know, like there's gotta be some benefit, but also at the same time, like, why would you, why would you have a skill challenge if there wasn't going to be an actual benefit or an actual detriment if you failed? And I, well, there's and definitely going to be a detriment. What I'm saying is, is like, I think if I remember right, the rules presented, like there was definitely a detriment, but yeah. I don't think the rules ever, the rules handled it like in any other challenge where it said you either succeed or fail. There's no, and if you succeed, and success you just is live. just, yeah, success is just not having the detriment. And yeah, I think that's yeah. how, and I, would, I think that's I would how the rules that are That just sounds like a lazy, poorly written, you know what I mean? That, that sounds like a lazy, poorly written skill challenge to me. I, I think that there has to be some payoff if you succeed. But maybe it's like, why would I yeah, do I'm a pretty sure. roll if nothing happens when I succeed? Uh, I'm pretty sure that's how they're, if I remember right, that's how they're kind of written in the adventure. And I'm sure somebody so. will tell and correct me if not. But so yeah, tell no. us your experience with skill challenges <laughs> in the comments below. Yeah. Um, because I think we're done with, so, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> I, the hard part with skill challenges is, is as much as I say that there are some things that I don't think you can effectively role play. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just don't. Yeah. Uh, there are some things that you just can't effectively solve by throwing dice. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, there are some things that are better done by role playing. Um, yeah. And there are, there are other things where, you know, if, if you're trying to add a challenge to it, then letting them role play their way through it mm -hmm. is, is a little bit harder unless the GM is really like, Oh, Hey, you were climbing and your hand slipped on a rock. I didn't hear you roll anything. We're just role playing. Well, <laughs> and, and to some degree, that's kind of an interesting conversation to have about just, you know, and kind of what we were talking about with that uh, empty black article a little bit ago is that sometimes dice, if they if they make it so that role playing is discouraged because it just summarizes into one dice, you know, you can have problems with that too. Sure, you know, because uh, I completely. and I think that you know, and this is something I think from our fabulous Ultima game that I, I in hindsight I think could have been probably a little bit better is that you know you guys could have been more active, but I don't think it's a as a game master, I educated you on how you could have been more active. So you were just like, well, we try to go faster. Well, what about trying to, you know, distance isn't a thing in Fabula Ultima. Maybe try to do something, you know, far out and anime-esque, you know, because that's the kind of action adventure that you're in. You know what I'm saying? And so sometimes the lack of knowledge of what you can do means that the skill challenge could also be kind of boring because then it just boils sure. down to the rules rather than actually and, envisioning. And, and, I, and I, like I said, I, I think that whole the whole mm. system wasn't fully mature. Maybe not. I, I don't know. I just, I remember reading about it and going, mm -hmm. there's some potential here for specific situations. And I think it probably got too broadly applied. It got poorly applied. It, mm -hmm. like, like Brent's example, that would have pissed me off too. I would have wanted to hit the GM in the head with that. <laughs> I would have wanted to find the guy who wrote the adventure and say, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> it definitely didn't turn out very, very good because it, 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 it literally felt like one of those. It felt like a video game where we expended mm -hmm, too many right. resources before the first action. Yeah. Fight. No, I, I can see that. Sorry. Okay, yeah. we can move past. Uh... Yeah. No. So, so I think. It is, however, I will say, skill challenges is considered, um, like, if you research online at all, it is considered the best mechanic from fourth edition. Random. <laughs> so yeah. Holy so shit. okay. Well, okay. you know, I mean, we again. By some people, this some is people, but this know. is again an introspective based on how yeah. we we what we know today without going into it. That's fair. So by going into it um, and you know actually <clears throat> playing the game, I'm curious to see how our impressions will change. And obviously, we're not going to play like a full one to twenty campaign or anything like that because that would be a different impression than a one you know one or two sessions or something like that. Um, because, you know, I think with Dungeons and Dragons, it's always kind of that bloat that higher in level you get, the harder it is to, um, you know, harder it is to balance everything. 
Sure. But I'm curious as to, you know, one of the things that people really liked about the edition is that they, at least for combat encounters, for its fourth edition seemed like they were better balanced than they were able to. Like 3.5 was hard to balance. Five is hard to balance, but fourth edition, based on the rules and how everything's situated out, it felt like people liked the balance that they were able to achieve. Did you guys feel that from your plays in fourth edition? I, I talked a lot, Brent. You want to start this one? <laughs> uh, no, uh, yes and no. <clears throat> um, okay. I, it, I think with the starter classes that you could get a pretty good balance, but I feel as their rules came out, they introduced some classes that weren't like the philosophy behind the class was broken. Mm. Um, and that made it a little bit harder to 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 create the challenges. Do you think they were trying to address some of the criticisms that start were starting to come out with the original classes? Maybe. And that's um, why they allowed some power creep because maybe I don't know. I I, I can't really say. I re yeah. I really don't know. Yeah. But like, but I do know that like they had the battle rager class, which is one that I I played personally. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact is that you could get five free hit points five temporary hit points just by hitting things which if your fighter is going to do every round is like and that's on their their like spammable attack like once that starts happening like they're in unkillable mm -hmm. like you are never really in danger because basically you have five hit points of, of damage negation always um okay. and but that was in a later edition of the game or like that was in uh, released in a, a different edition but I think at the beginning it was pretty easy to balance. You kind of balanced it like a video game. You figured out, like, I think the math of balancing a challenge, they had pretty good for that. Um, sure. As far as, like, because they they had, like, you had minion monsters and then intermediate monsters and then boss monsters, and you could kind of, and they were very specific. They mm -hmm. weren't just, uh, like, it wasn't just this is a chimera. It was, like, this is a den of chimeras. There's three baby snaggletooth chimeras, and then they had stat blocks for those. And then they had you have juvenile chimeras, and then there's stat blocks for those. And then you have mama chimera, and then there's a specific stat block. I for mean, that. wasn't the the base? Wasn't that just like minions, and they just like had one hit point? Like, mm -hmm. like you basically Some, hit them, and like they, that. They, they they explode like a dry dandelion. Well, they had they had abilities, and some of them had hit points. <clears throat> Um, and then the number of them would match up to like whatever challenge rating it was. Like okay. they had that, that balanced out very well because it was balanced. It was balanced out like a video game. Sure. Um, basically, they used the similar. I think they used a similar algorithm to what you would use when you, you balance a video game. Like how many enemies yeah. can kill this? You know, okay. And then and, test it. And I think I, I remember from the time that you know, I, and maybe that was you, Brent, from back in then, or but I, or it might have been another one of our friends who said it was very much like, you know, it was very very similar and and looked a lot like an mmo in terms of just how the progression worked you know how everyone had similar mm -hmm. like level up abilities and abilities felt like they just were reskinned you know so that wasn't that it was like since you both got an ability you got the d8 ability you got the d6 ability because of your all that kind of stuff um did you guys did you guys feel that when you were playing it did you guys feel it was pretty much more computer game design than um that the there was game. obviously the MMO aspect um, mm -hmm. because like, like just the idea that every character had a role uh, as well as their class. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because uh, who hasn't played an MMO and you have tanks and you have healers mm -hmm. and you know, like yada, yada, yada. Right. Sure. Um, so yeah, the, I, I think that was obvious, you know, mm -hmm. you know, for, uh, from the get go. And for a while it was kind of cool. Brent's like no, no, no. no. <laughs> D and D always sort of had them. D and D always sort of had roles. They just weren't spelled out and defined. And some mm -hmm. characters that we assumed were good at one role really fucking weren't. Yeah. Well, uh, the fact that they at least tried to do it, I, and, I, I thought was okay. But and I'm in all honesty, that. like. You know, I mean, it, it, it's not bad for them to take design cues from video games and vice versa, right? I mean, I've played, you know, the Pathfinder video games made up, made by Alcat, and they have been, a, you know, a, a great amount of fun. And they've been, they've had a basis in the role playing game. So it kind of informed how the video game played, but then vice versa, you know, there are great video games out there that are in the role playing space that have neat mechanics that may translate to a pen and paper 
role playing game. And I don't think it's bad to to kind of incorporate that kind of stuff either. So I think it it, it could be a, a good two way street. Sure. But do you think that like people at the time felt that that was like like you know you're trampling on our turf because you know MMOs are not tabletop games. <laughs> I don't think it's that simple. Um, the reason that I dislike the introduction of things like Striker and that is because, again, it influences a mindset that I feel is contrary to sometimes telling a good story. Um, and been anytime I run a game, it's more about the story than like than that's the combat stuff. Yeah. Um, it'll happen, but like you would never in fourth edition, you would never have a party of all bards, no matter how fun that sounds. Yeah, that would never happen because the game intrinsically, at its core, discourages mm -hmm. that. Because you well, can't I, have a you can't have a tank bard, you can't have a healer bard, you can't have a. Uh, I think a bard is a striker. I think in the game, mm -hmm. or are they a controller? They might be a I, controller. I, I, honestly, I don't remember from so. the um, from the from the fourth edition. I don't remember, edition. and I have uh, I have no. a lot to learn in the next few days. Yeah. Um, and I think and I and like that like even though no matter how much fun it sounds like oh we'll all play bards. Um, like you, no matter how much fun that is, and you, and even in three point five, you could make a capable party of that where you could do enough weird mm -hmm. things with feats and stuff where you could cover some gaps. Is it going to be? Is it going to be the min max party? No. no, but you could play the game I, still. So I, um, yeah, in fourth I would, edition I would you still, couldn't. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm talking. About yeah, in fourth edition, in fourth edition, um, you couldn't. The game intrinsically is said that that's not what. It would be like playing. It would be how many dungeons have you done in World of Warcraft with uh, uh, five DPS characters, Mike? Me? Uh, not not a lot. I mean, it typically. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. There are people that do skill challenges where they take like all druids, for example, and go do like one class in the entire dungeon. But then they fill multiple roles, right? Because the the well, yeah, druids do. Yeah, they're yeah. Both so I mean, I've I've seen those kind of things, but I've never seen like an all rogue party go into a dungeon and then. Like one in, rogue in, tags a monster and runs away while everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, DPS is the shit out of it. Yeah, like that's the thing, and that and that's and and again, it in, reinforces a mindset that I think that's going to happen. Not just yeah. and in, in in fourth edition's case, it's not just a mindset; it's a it's a fact. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, so it'll be interesting to see if it has that feeling so much now that we're looking at it. Um, because you know, like I said, I would I would be okay with Larian's version of Baldur's Gate three being the new version of Dungeons and Dragons. Like, <laughs> I, there's a there's a part of me that says Baldur's Gate three was fun, and you had a much more active play style with it. You had more things that you could do, and so that would be I, I would have been okay with that. But we're not going to get that. So we'll look forward to our review of the new D and D books. I mean, in I mean, a I couple months, I'm, May or something books, like that. Question mark? <laughs> like I don't I play fourth edition. I don't know that I'm willing to. Uh, Not one to do fifth edition, fifth edition revised or, or sixth whatever edition. The, yeah, whatever the hell they're calling it. Sorry, uh, Bard was a leader, by the way. They were one of the ones that oh. made people do other. They they were the other ones that made people do shit, other okay. shit. Like they use their okay. turn to make other people do stuff. So well, they, means, I mean, they could do stuff on their own, but they were more. They accomplish more a lot of times. Yeah. Well, and they did stuff like the 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 warlord, like his spammable attack, if I remember right, was like he hit something for like minimal damage and then made somebody else do something. So you were active. Yeah. Like right. you were doing something and doing and and encouraging someone to like move or something like that. Yeah. Um, so okay. Well and and I mean, like, don't get me wrong, we'll go probably over a oh, little bit more detail of the different roles and stuff like that as we build characters. Uh, no, we, we 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 uh, will, and it's it's but yeah, it yeah. it was a combat game, and and incorporating some of that stuff, I don't think was horrible. I I don't know if it worked the way that they intended because I don't know what they intended. If I'm being honest, and okay. I I know how I felt, you know, playing it later, as I got more combats and more stuff under my belt, they had six they had succeeded at the power at limiting the power creep that they had in three point five. Mm -hmm. By making every character feel the exact same and constrained. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I had, made everybody... I, had, I had a special they... attack, once per day attack called cake, and Brent had a special once per day attack called pudding. And they had different names and they had different descriptions, but at the end of the day, they did the exact same effing thing. Yeah. They essentially, yeah, did the same thing. Essentially, they like the effects were different, but 
Mine did 8.4 points of damage on average, and Brent's did 8.4 points of damage on average. Yeah, everything mm -hmm. just kind of, yeah, like they level everything. Everything was tuned to the point where everybody was putting this, we were all walking around like this, and we didn't we didn't realize it at first. I, um, I started to uh, say this about games, is people don't really want a balanced game. They want a game with the perception of balance. Because like mm. once once everything's this like once it's balanced everything's pretty much the same like everybody does the same thing and it's just like like you have to make some like to differentiate between the fighter and the wizard like you had to be super creative because how you described your attack was gonna be how it was different like you had to be like mm -hmm. I'm a wizard and I use my magic missile and purple beams of arrows of light shoot out of my fingers and that was the only thing that was gonna make it different than I use twin strike and hit him twice for the same amount of damage yeah. as your magic missile. Um, and then like, and then there's that thing that happened too, where it was like, well, these minions, let's just get rid of them. And we use our, we use our dailies and just crush them. And then it's like, okay, well now we're going to rest. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> I guess. Um, <laughs> and there was definitely MMO influence. One of the things that I will suggest say is one of the strangest things that I saw in the book that I that made me really draw the MMO preference. And it's not even about combat. It was um they had rules for disenchanting items mm. that read exactly like the disenchantment skill in World of Warcraft. Um, <laughs> where like you disenchant an item and it made Ethereum for you to Oh right. Yeah, and it's like the plan was uh, the plan for fourth edition was to try and pull people away from MMOs. I, I think that was the plan. Um, if I even remember their marketing, I think there was there were ads in comic books that said, if you want to play an elf, at least do it with your friends or something like that. Yeah. Um, and so that I think that was the goal was to try and make an MMO tabletop game. And mm -hmm. like the goals of those two types of games are very different. Sure. <laughs> no, no, yeah. they are. You you bring up good points. Um I I I loved the idea that my magic items, you know, like did, like did they didn't they didn't just because in a video game, right? I have a plus two sword. When I get the plus three sword, do you know what happens to the plus two sword? It lays there on the fucking ground behind me because nobody cares. In in most video games, MMOs, some of them like if you can disenchant and do stuff, you know, are different, right? Mm -hmm. Where you can move you can take the ability off and move it to another item that's that looks better or i sure i i like having some flexibility one of the issues that i had though with the fourth edition magic items is they were generic and again limited into this tiny ass box so that they weren't so powerful that you actually felt like holy shit i got something that's a real difference maker here no you got a little you got your little stat bump and in two levels you know what you're going to get another stat bump there, kiddo. It's going to be great. You'll have a plus two, and it'll be so much better. And in two more levels, you'll get a plus three. It'll hmm. be fantastic. I don't even remember if all of the items in fourth edition, I will have to look. I don't think most of them even gave stat bumps. Most of them gave you a once-a-day ability. Okay, like most, sure. most no, of them no, gave right. you okay, most of them gave right. like a one-combat ability. Like You can hit for plus three once in, yeah, in a was... once a combat or something like that it it, it 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 had the ability tags just like the classes because everything was about everything was balanced around that and so the minute that you did something that was different like add a stat bonus to a weapon i think it the, the system starts to have a problem if i remember right so <laughs> a lot of them just had ability i think if i remember right and no, i might I, be I, wrong I, I, but i think, I think they right. just it was either a lot of them or I, well, the really cool ones I know did like the re like if you got a wand that did something, it was like once a turn or well, yeah, once well, a, we had to hold yeah. down the magic users because remember the the, <laughs> the one before that hold no, them under fucking water. I, I understand that your guys's play groups weren't like that, but I played with a lot of groups in in three point five, like like I said, we're like I'm doing twenty points of damage, and this guy did a hundred and twenty. And after six combats, it feels like I might as well not even be there. If I, I hear we're going into combat, I should just sit the fuck down and watch because that's how much I'm actually contributing to the combat. Um, uh, the and there, there, there was a lot of groups where, like, especially in higher level games, where there wasn't a reason to have a martial character because all of the wizards and they were just like, poof, everybody's fucking dead. 
We never, I guess, I guess that is one thing that's funny about our parties. I don't think in many of my parties had very many like wizards and we never got very high level. I do remember we had a null cleric in one of my games that spent like the first turn casting his buff spells to be better than the fighter. I do remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm probably over power gaming that, but I, I did play with some groups where it was, it was punishing. If you weren't like on the internet searching for like the best builds, like it honestly, it it it, it was disheartened. It just you might as well, well ever, have even been there. I mean, that's remember that's why we were surprised at the D and D Beyond thing when they said fighters are the most. Oh, that was my other. Sorry, that was my other. The point. most prolific char point character. When they, when they talked about wanting to replace MMOs, remember they promised all this digital con. They promised all this digital support and content that they never really delivered on. Like it. No. They delivered a little bit, and then they just yeah. sort of walked away. Yeah. Like. Like, well, the game pretty much. We never mentioned game, that. What are you talking about? I think <laughs> the game pretty much. They were like, "Oh, this is a mistake," um, because remember what happened. What re fourth edition really did was made Pathfinder happen, um, and then Pathfinder started taking a big chunk of their business. Yeah, and and we'll never know if Pathfinder actually outsold D and D in the in the grand scheme of things. But the rumor is is that it did. At least urban legends are. Or it was getting close. I don't know if it ever surpassed them. Yeah, but I, remember I mean, I no, I I, I don't know. I I mean, but I mean. Remember, I remember Pathfinder. Oh, it's just D and D three point seven five, mm -hmm. because they're never going to go to fourth edition. They're always going to live in three point five, and at least they got rid of some of the power creep, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. They did better balancing it, yeah. yeah. And, and the other thing, so yeah, so what happened was is they leveled out all the characters and made them all feel samey. And then in the later books, and you might be right, this might have been in trying to address what people had said. They started doing these really weird power creep things where like. Like I said, the Battle Rager had basically fought 10 points of damage reduction basically mm -hmm. all the time, which made him basically unkillable. And there's another character that came out called the Avenger that I remember thinking, this is insane. Because it was a striker who basically's job was to isolate the big monsters away from everybody else and fight it by himself for a while. Oh, yeah. No, that whole lockdown idea, right? Like, yeah. I lock this guy down so he can't mess up everybody else and they can clean up mm -hmm. the room and... And, and the thing is, help me. and like that doesn't work because, and like you have to think about this in an MMO sense because that's what the game is, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's one guy that can fight your big bad for 27 rounds while everybody else cleans out the room, mm -hmm. why is that guy fighting the big bad? That guy's just going to go around and fucking kill every little thing until you how, all can. <laughs> how were your combats with the uh, 47 guys who had eight hit points, only 27 rounds? <laughs> well, you know what I, you know what you I, you weren't mean. taking. Do, were you guys <laughs> automatically hitting Brent? <laughs> What I'm saying, though, is, is like if you develop a character that has enough defenses and enough damage to just pull the big bad out of the combat from everybody else and fight him by himself for any amount of time, that's not what's going to happen. That guy's just going to fight the stuff that he can kill easy so everybody can fight the big bad at the same time, making the fight easier. Like, that mm -hmm. blows their whole sense of balance out of... Yeah. Like, it, it starts, to, it starts to really screw up the sense of balance because it's like... Well, it's like um, in... in uh, in World of Warcraft for a while, like Death Knights could fuck solo anything for a while, couldn't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they were yeah. they were horribly imbalanced in Wrath of the Lich King because that yeah. Was so it's like, why action. is anybody like why why are we going to play anything else or why are we going to do this any other way? He can just do this, mm -hmm. like well, yeah. And and, and and at least the you know when you kind of compare it to MMOs, MMOs with their attempt at balance always seem to run into the problem that they're chasing balance and little tweaks here cause. It's like one of the a butterfly right. flaps that's raining. It ripples. It's, it's, it's so uh, like yeah. whack-a-mole. So yeah, so you're always seeing these damage charts and stuff like that that people are like, well, in this in this patch, this is the highest damage. Yeah. And obviously, these are top tier players, and you're seeing just kind of how everything goes sure. out. Your your mileage may vary, kind of thing, based on how you play. But it's just like you know, it's just it's the it's there, but they're always chasing it because they're not willing to accept that there may be situations that favor some classes better than others, or that mm -hmm. they have they intrinsically don't have a balance in the game. And I think you're absolutely right, Brent, when you said that they wanted the perception of balance. Mm -hmm. Because I think if you at least felt like the reason why people would want to, like people would want to play classes rather than necessarily they they want to play classes because they're balanced, I think you'd have much more fun designing that game. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it just, it's like... Well, I mean, so what, what spawned, what made me start thinking about that is um, one of the things that happened in my group when I played 40K mm -hmm. was they said, well, there's the, the game's just not balanced. And it's like, well, no, but that's not what the fun of the game is. Like, the fun of the mm -hmm. game is winning sometimes when you're not supposed to. Um, if you want a balanced game, like chess is the most balanced game that you can play because yeah. everybody's the same, essentially. Um, and then the first person 
still has a slight, a slight advantage. Well, and I mean, it's it's kind of some of those things in like, and I don't know if I'm remembering correctly, but I felt I felt at one point Warhammer 40k did have like a little bit of a rock paper scissors thing where like there were certain armies that definitely fared better against other armies because of because of like certain types of you know like certain a- attributes of their army and i felt like in those kind of cases if you had a, a an army that was quote unquote strong against an army that was weak and you over you took you turned the tide that was awesome you felt great for right exactly maximizing your stuff and, and taking advantage of a, a, a dab of luck a dab of tactics and you know a bunch of yeah. other stuff and so right. i think exactly yeah. I think pure balance always feels like it's hard to get, but I don't mind the like if there's a little bit of rock, paper, scissoring to it, you know, where some right, yeah, you don't. I mean, that's the thing, it's like you don't people people always say they want a balanced game, but I just don't I I think I I don't think it's true in all cases. Like you want a Mm. game that appears balanced on the surface, but Mm. there's little interest little things that are gonna make it interesting. Because like a purely balanced game is very vanilla, I think. No, that's true. And 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 I, I think it's important is to stress that like some of this that we're talking about, like with balance, it really comes down to to games that involve a lot of combat mm-hmm. or a lot of skill checks or skill challenges or different different things. Because if we're just like in a rules light role playing game, it doesn't matter if the classes are that balanced because it doesn't come up all that often. You know, it comes up in specific instances, but I. I think, like especially in a combat-heavy game, and I, I, to me, the holy grail is that everybody has moments where they're like, holy shit, I just did that? Not like, I expect every turn to average 82.5 DPS. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Like, like you have moments where if, if, if somebody's helping you or the die fall right or something, you know what I mean? Something fucking spectacular happens, mm-hmm. and every class has access to potential wonder you know Mm -hmm. what i mean because i think that's what keeps you playing but if every class has access to potential mediocrity except you hit mediocrity 95 percent of the time yeah exactly it it, uh yeah you get get the 400 round combats and at the end everybody's just like jesus is this thing not over can can, can we just be done can we just and again like in a game like D&D, where you invest a lot of time creating your character, hitting that mediocrity level feels really bad because it's like, it why did I not just take a lot less time making this character? Sure. Uh, and I and I will say one thing is like, get kind of what we talked about last episode is with like the Fallout thing. Like all of the times my character missed didn't matter. The times that my care like to me in fee- in my feels like all the times my character did shitty didn't matter because he did that cool thing with the tower. Mm-hmm. Um, like. And that's and that's kind of what the big picture of the like Spoiler the thing alert. is, yeah. Well, yeah. They heard spoilers in the last episode too. Um, but anyways, go ahead, Mike. Sorry. No, I was just I was just gonna say something about <laughs> character creation and I, oh I know what I was gonna say. I was gonna say something about the the fact that I feel like some games are able to more align you with the fantasy of the character that you want to play mm-hmm. and make it feel satisfying to play it in that way and some of that doesn't get abstracted into me- mechanics very well but sometimes when it does it feels really rewarding to play the game and have it and have the outcomes match your your head canon as to what it should be because i mean if you feel like you're going to play a fighter who's tough and you get into your first combat and you get basically skewered by all the goblins and you're just you know you're resting on their spears by the end of round two then I mean, I don't feel like I would. I would be like, I don't feel very heroic or very good at this point. Right. No, <laughs> and I think I think that's a thing that happens often in some D twenty games. I'm not going to name names, um, where like you have this headcanon of how your character wants to be, and it actually becomes a detriment or put a potential detriment to your your player character. Like, um, like if you want to play, what's one of the worst classes in D anD D right now? Like, if you want to play a circle of spores druid in the role-playing game they're just not very good and you're 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 intentionally hobbling yourself in a portion of the game because you want to you have this concept of a character and that's the yeah. sort of shit that i hate like that's the sort of shit that makes me not like a game like bar none is like the things like yeah you all have to you can't you can't you can't have any very, very uh, uh you have to have different classes like no one can play the same class no one can you know stuff where like interesting role-playing options take a backseat to 
Party you have to have yeah party composition or build composition like sure, that, sure. that that shit is the shit that drives me insane and that's why i started leaning towards more narrative games that's why i started playing like unknown armies and other mm -hmm. games is because like that stuff that stuff it's just not, well and the other thing is it's just not and i know i shouldn't use this word realistic it's just not realistic like that you won't have two people with similar skill sets on the same team like it's just yeah, yeah. well but so i think it I breaks think my the... immersion god damn it it's oh, realistic that the elder guy visit you at night. Breaks my immersion. <laughs> God damn it! So, get so off guess, my lawn. So I guess what what it boils down to is is that most of us at least most of us had critiques of fourth edition D anD. Um, some of us played it more than others, and obviously, you know, be, me being in the shallower end of that pool, and maybe Brent being in the deeper end, and Jeff falling somewhere in between. Um, so, but our but it doesn't feel like any of us were posit as positive about it, even in the beginning, as maybe we thought. You know, definitely Brent playing more of it maybe dove in much more excitedly than me and Jeff did. But or at least me, you know, I mean, I can't speak for Jeff. But I think I'll be curious to see if and after all these years we get back into it and we go, oh, there's a certain elegance to how this game was created that, you know, now us old curmudgeonly gamers are like oh this this makes a lot of fucking sense like <laughs> maybe you know i'd be mean, i'm curious that's, about that and that is one thing that i want to say is like everybody's table's different like mm -hmm. there's yeah. a lot more uniformity to how games get played now because we can see how people play them on the internet mm -hmm. um like we can see how the game should like the rules should work um whereas back then like it wasn't a thing like actual plays weren't a thing like i I didn't watch an actual play up until like, I don't know, a couple years ago. Um, so you didn't know how other tables were doing it. So you kind of had your own thing. So that's the other thing to remember about fourth edition because we're old. You need to remember is um, like, <laughs> like we played, <laughs> we played the game, like the book that said, and our interpretation of the rules. So like how we ran skill challenges, Jeff might be hundred percent correct. We might, we might, my, my GM at the time may have run them wrong every time. I mean, um because but but i really have but yeah so that's the thing to remember is if you but, love fourth edition it may have been your table may have been great too and maybe ours wasn't and no was it could be problem. i i would yeah. just say if you have a, a major mechanic in the game and the players every time it comes up feel that it's punitive i would say that something is wrong <laughs> well that's game <laughs> design gm choice adventure writing something's wrong if the only way that it makes the players feel is, well that's fucking punitive like just, why don't you just sure. pick one of us at random to kill to make it harder and i think well and i think and skill one thing i want to say about skill challenges i do think skill challenges are a neat idea but i think there needs to be some like i don't necessarily know if dnd is the right system for it, it because it is so binary like well it just is so sure. binary it's so you fail you 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 do it or you don't there's no there's no like you do it with complications you do it with you know a benefit there's it's just yes or no like your idea of having a situation where if you if you win the skill challenge you know you get something out of it that's great but i don't think that's i'm i i i, I really have a hard time believing you're, in the rules you're saying that you're way. saying i'm living on rose colored glasses <laughs> i'm saying that i don't <laughs> think the rules written that way i'm saying okay. that like everything it's presented more as a binary equation like you win and and nothing happens and or you lose and terrible shit happens all right you, you ready for the hate mail uh yeah i am okay so because we're gonna get we're gonna get we're gonna get some hate comments if anybody made it this far okay <laughs> but by far the thing that i most fondly remember i didn't even hate the cards with the powers on them because i already i played magic and i had all the sleeves right i sleeved all my power cards it was the dungeon tiles it was the it was the 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 for the time they looked great. They were modular and you could combine them. And mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You didn't have to do the shitty hand-drawn maps. I think that's still a good I think that's still a good I, I still loved the dungeon tiles. I mean, they like, still make them. Th no, no, they do. That Yeah, they still have the, them. The, the mo the mo dare I say it? The most successful thing to come out of 4th edition d, &D <laughs> was fucking high-quality dungeon, dungeon tiles. Dungeon tiles? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was a good idea. Like I said, and, and honestly, my experience with 4th edition would probably have been... Um, uh, a little bit better with dungeon tiles and more props. I think that's my key to gaming now is props. Props in, in person. I think it's props. That's my new thing. Okay. 
you know, I, I don't plan on any props. Um, although we are playing aliens and I feel like aliens would be better played in person, having like the map out and stuff like that. And uh, kinda... Aliens needs mood lighting, Mike. Aliens uh, needs it to be flickering what, lights. <laughs> well, if you're running an aliens game, what you need exactly, is exactly yes. The, did you put the... a seizure warning before you did that? <laughs> no. What you need you if you're running an aliens game is the life size um <laughs> alien egg that i found with face hugger inside that you can take out that's oh, what nice. you need for an alien that would, yeah that would be <laughs> that was on the bargain bin or was that like <laughs> oh no it was like it's like a prop style it's like a prop scale prop design alien egg so it was pretty expensive but man if i was running alien games uh, with any like if i was running a con alien game i'd be like where do i put my alien egg when it comes <laughs> yeah just, just so kind of everybody's <laughs> aware that it's there <laughs> Just like you have something to the side of you with like a cover on it, and everyone's just like, "What's that?" And you're like, "You find a thing." Yeah, you found a thing. <laughs> New toy. <Have laughs> yeah. Fun. No, it's so. life size. It's like five. It's like four feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> so on alien face huggers, um, I think so. I think we're looking forward to it. What's probably going to happen is is that we'll actually do the character creation, and so if you're watching this, is going to be a little bit of a time skip because we'll do character creation. That this video will come out, so whatever. Those of you that keep that, those of you that are paying attention and get 55 minutes into a, the podcast, we appreciate you for. We watching love this. you. We watch. We appreciate you Thank for you. watching this entire time and all that kind of stuff. Um, but with that, do you, Jeff? Do you want to? Tell people how they can continue the conversation. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure if you stuck around this long, there was something that one of us said that you felt was wrong. Please let us know on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Threads, Twitter, and YouTube at Rollwise. Or you could even just email us, rollwiseguys at gmail.com. Somebody's going to take us up on that email thing eventually. Um, and it's just going to be just a wall of hate. Um, anyways, uh, thank you for listening if you listen this far or if you listen at all. But you're not going to hear my thank you if you don't hear the end. Um, uh, as always, uh, roll well, roll wise, and be safe out there and watch out for aliens. All right. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody.